Avoidance. What are you avoiding? What are you running away from? Shout out to I Am The Christia. We have an I Am The Christia sighting. Haven't seen her in like a year. So it's good to see that you're alive and well, my friend. My friend, my friend. So today's topic comes courtesy of a good friend of the show, Julie Bean. So this is Julie Bean's topic today. And it's about avoidance. What are you running from? Why are you running from whatever it is that you're running from? Is it beneficial for you to avoid that thing? Is that thing an aspect of yourself? Is it some aspect of society? Is it, you know, love, a significant other, you know, something negative? Who knows? So instead of me sitting here talking and going on and on, we're going to bring Julie Bean in and we're going to let Julie Bean have her moment to explain exactly what it is that we're talking about today. And then we could hop into the conversation. Um, if you want to join the panel, click the button down there. It looks like a camera with a plus symbol in it. And I'll make sure I get you in here and we'll make sure you have an opportunity to express your best or worst or mediocre <laughs> self. Cool Beans um, took a much needed long social media break. Yeah, it be like that sometimes. So. Respect to that. What's up, Aaron? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Let's get Julie Bean in here, get the conversation on and pop it. Send out the invite, Julie. Julie Bean. Hi. What's happening? How are you? I feel good. You don't have your cornrows anymore. No, I'm getting new braids tomorrow. <laughs> get new braids tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you hit me up. And you said you wanted to talk about something in reference to what are you running away from? Yes. So explain to the good people exactly what our topic is today and what you mean by it so that we can have an understanding. So um, I was thinking about like self-awareness and the work that I have been doing mm -hmm. for like the past year. And... I realize that even though I am working to better myself, there are some things that I really want to avoid. <laughs> and, okay. and in this case, it's not necessarily something that I'm avoiding because it is internal that I want to avoid, uh, that I need to work on. It's more I have been self-reflecting and I determined that I need to avoid certain things in other people to stay on track. Okay, so let's talk about it then. Let's figure it out. So I came to the determination that I need to avoid people who are not conscious that they need growth. So you need to avoid people who are not self-aware. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does being around people who are self-aware, how does that negatively affect you? Who aren't self-aware? Yeah, so you're avoiding people who are not self-aware because people who are not self-aware must do something to you to make you feel a way that you don't want to feel or have an experience that you don't want to experience. Yeah, so in doing this work this past year, I realized that we all need to do work on ourselves. Like, none of us are perfect. And I come to appreciate the live and the people that are on here because it seems like a lot of them know they have work to do. So when you talk to someone who's just oblivious is one thing, but refusing to acknowledge that they need work is frustrating because I'm in a different space and I'm speaking from a place of wanting to better myself and if I'm around people who don't want to do that, like all they do is drink and smoke and go to the clubs every weekend, like that to me is not the direction that I want to continue to grow in my life. And I don't think that I can learn from that type of individual. Okay. So if we were to put an exact label on it, you're avoiding people who are who are not self-aware because it makes you feel what? like I'm going backwards. Like, okay. Like maybe I am wasting my time, you know, with those individuals. Like I'm not learning and growing from them. 
So it makes you feel non-productive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not productive. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I was thinking, I, I just came to me right then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just trying to put a label on it because I'm like, okay, cool. So then that tells you that you're someone who would rather be productive than mm -hmm. not productive. Yeah. Okay. So then in a couple months, this is October, November, December. So you have about two months before you enter the guppy pool of the day. Right? <laughs> yeah. So how are you going to go about dating? Because you're going to be meeting new people. Some of them will be dates. Some of them will just be people because you're in the dating pool. How do you go about avoiding these people who aren't self-aware? How do you avoid them or deal with them? So um, one point that you made earlier that like I, I look at my growth and what I'm working on and ask those type of questions like for example i'm working on communicate being a better communicator I, I know i'm actively working on that so i will begin to ask that type of question like how are you working on bettering your communication with people or what are you doing to um better your communication i i've never thought to ask that to anyone in general, really, because I thought if you speak the language, you're communicating, <laughs> oh. <laughs> right? That's what I thought. But really, communication is like a whole nother world. Um, and you explore people's mindset and where they are simply by having dialogue and going back and forth. So communication is one thing that I will be asking about. And self-improvement, like self-work. Um, I didn't realize that it's like, uh, it has to be like a way of life. I, I, I realize that now. Um, it's not a temporary thing. So I will be asking whoever it is <laughs> uh, <laughs> what kind of self-work they're doing actively. Um, and if they don't know how to answer that question, I will be running in the other direction. <laughs> okay. So you're not, so on this particular topic, you for you, you're not looking at what you're running away from within yourself. You're looking at what are you avoiding out there in the world, which still is a reflection of you in terms of, okay, I don't want to be around non-productive people. That means I want to be productive. Hmm. So I wonder how it's going to feel the first time you're on a date and you give a guy one of these questions and he doesn't have an answer and you realize like, this is a crash and burn. <laughs> That's that's probably like one of my biggest fears is like having more awareness now and it's like knowing knowing what you want but still having to give the person the benefit of the doubt. It's almost like like fifty fifty. Like what do you do because you just you're just meeting somewhere. I, I'm just meeting someone, and I really don't know what to expect. But I know what I would like to hear. Okay. What would you like to hear? What is it? So you asked a question. What's, give me one of your questions. Okay. So one of my questions is going to be, um, what kind of, what kind of actions do you take to uh, self-improve? I don't know if that's a weird question. But... Okay. So, so what are you working on to self-improve? And this person says, I, you know, I self-improvement. I mean, I go to work, I go home, I pay my bills. I got good credit and I got a nice place to stay. So, I mean, other than improving the amount of money that I, um, I don't really feel the need to improve anything else. <laughs> okay, so... That's my next piece. I need to work on all of this, and I need to work on what to say after that. Because I would, I just want to be like, "Oh, okay, thank you." But I, you know, it's hard. But I, I really have no idea what to. It's, it will be so awkward because. The whole purpose of that question is tr to try to create some dialogue, you know, and see where 
the conversation can go from there. And come on, like that answer doesn't give me anything to work with. Okay, so so either and it, that doesn't just because that a person gives that answer doesn't mean that they're not doing self work. They could have misinterpreted your your question, or they could have just been thinking on a more shallow basis at that point in time. So then. If you're kind of in a situation where you where it's not speed dating and you're like, okay, get him out of here, then that's where you have to make sure that you are prepared with the next question. So then you could reflect upon yourself. You could say, well, okay, I didn't really mean in that way. And then you might use yourself for an example. You might say, well, you know, I realized that I haven't always been that great at communicating or communicating while I was angry or sad. So mm-hmm. I've read a couple of books on it and then I got a life coach. And, you know, and in my live group therapy thing, I discuss emotions. I discuss, I articulate my points while while having negative emotions, per se, so that I can be better at that. Is that something that you're doing, too? Like, do you feel like you need to work on your communication? You see, so you give them an example, right? And then you throw it back to them to see if they're like, yeah, or they're like, what? No, nah, I'm good. Okay, now here's my question to that is, what about those people who are really good at picking up on those kind of things and they'll just say yes just to pass the que- like get an A on that test? <laughs> so you got to dig deep, right? You got to, you know, it would be like, um, so tell me, because like, you know how when Coach J comes on, I'll be laughing at her. I'll be like, this, like the relationship sounds like a therapy session, right? And she's like, yeah, yeah but that's what it is. So if you kind of get that feeling like, okay, that feeling as if they're just kind of playing the game, Mm -hmm. then you have, if you care enough, you have to keep digging deeper to be like, okay, so in your last relationship, why didn't your last relationship work? Right? What kind of arguments did y'all have? How did that end? And then typically most people are going to tell you the things that the other person did that was wrong or caused the end of the 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 the, the relationship mm-hmm. and your job to poke and prod to find out what how they contributed to it right because mm-hmm. if they're saying that they're doing self-work they should be able to acknowledge what they did and what the other person did and how they have changed what they could change to improve and say you know well maybe the other person just wasn't ready to level up right but it's hard to keep a lie or a facade alive when someone's asking you about specific events in your past. Mm, yeah. Because you're going to have to start making stuff up, right? And after a while, it's going to be like, no, nah, oh, no, nope, got to get you out of here. You, yeah. You pump. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Ahog said um, avoidance and running are 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 very different. You agree with that or you disagree with that? I'm trying to process that. I think I'm running from people. What's up, Doc? Hey. How you doing? Good. How you guys doing? All right. I think I'm running from the other direction. (laughs) So. Yes. Run. What's the the difference in running and avoiding, Dr. Hope? So I think that when you say, what are you running from? It's you not facing those things that you really, really need to face, and you're running from that. But when you're avoiding something, which I like what Julie was saying, you're avoiding those things that may impact your growth or your journey. Oh, okay. And that's what it sounds like. You're avoiding those things because it may, you know, you know, pull you back a couple steps. So that's when you do have to run back. But I think when it, when we say we're running away from things, those are the things that we have to face, we know we have to face, and we try to get away from it hmm. instead of dealing with it. That's why I said that. Hmm, what do you think about it? Um, well, then I'm, I'm running. Then I'm because I'm not. Hold on, hold on. Hey, Doc. Yes. You got to mute your mic. Cause we, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. All right, go ahead, Julie. No, but I, after her explanation, and I think I'm avoiding. Because I'm not running from 
those types of people or that situation because of something that reminds me of myself. I'm not running from that. I think that I I I know what what my path at least one day at a time where I want things to go and that person wherever they are in their life if they're not doing the self work I would prefer to to avoid them altogether like you know I think that the people that you have around you they uh, ultimately they affect and help shape your life so if I know that I'm on this path because I experienced X, Y, and Z and I don't want to go to that place again, I'm not going to bring those people from back then with me. Because they're, the whole reason why I kind of had to shed a lot of that was because I realized I needed to do some work on myself, but the people around me were not realizing that. So it's like you going to the right and they just going in circles. They're going to the right. They're not going left. They're not going up and down. They're going to go in circles. It's just going to delay, I think, my own process. Mm. So Jesse, Jesse has a question. And she says, is it fair to say that avoidance and running has an intersection? Dr. Hulk, unmute your mic so we can get your opinion on that. Say that again. She said what? Is it fair? She said, is it fair to say that avoidance running has an intersection? Oh, yeah, because like I said, you know, when you're avoiding something and you're trying to get away from you, you do need to run because, you know, you got to outrun that thing. But um, so at some point they do because, again, you're avoiding we avoid things that we're running from too, that we need to face. You know, there was <laughs> some something that I was running for from for a long time, um, and wish that it never reared its ugly head. But I knew in the back of my mind, at some point in time, I gotta face this because it kept me in a place where I'm always looking over my shoulder. Because I knew that's something that I, you know, I had to eventually deal with. But for my own peace, I had to say, let me go ahead and face this so it's over and done with. Hmm. Okay. All right, Doc, back on mute. <laughs> Appreciate you. Okay, cool. So my software doesn't delineate between the two. I think. The way the way I interpret it is based on the particular situation that's occurring. When I hear, what up, Mikhail? We're going to get you up in a minute, my brother. And uh, Tyrell, if you're still in here, we're going get, to get, get you in here too, get some odds action. Um, to me, they're the same. It just depends on what it is that you're avoiding or running away from. Because you can avoid yourself or you can avoid negative situations out in the world. You could run from yourself, quote unquote, run from yourself. Or you can run from um, negative situations or positive situations out in the world. I think the context behind which it is that you are doing either one of those is what can begin to delineate what it is that you're doing. Now, I, when you say running from, right, running from sounds really extreme. Mm -hmm. Because running is a is like an act, like it's like an active action, right? So I'm like actively running away from. I can avoid by being still, right? I can sit still and avoid something, right? I can avoid going to work by not going to work, right? But if I go to work and then leave, I have to run away from. So I think running away is, is a more extreme action. And I think that's why, that's why what Dr. Hawk is saying actually makes sense to me. But at their core, to me, they're both just the the attempt to get away from, in some way, shape, or fashion, some aspect of yourself or society, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I got to a point where um, I had to stop running from whatever was... I'm, like, internalizing a lot of things, so I realized I need to deal with whatever these issues are, because 
I can bury them, but they're still going to be there, right? So once I began doing that work, I realized, okay, a lot of the people that are around me are contributing to some of the things that I really was trying to better mm. for myself. And that's what I said, like, come, come the new year, I, I want to tread lightly and just be very careful with who I exchange, like, that energy with and, and try to, you know, begin to grow with because... It takes a lot of work, and I feel like very easily all of that work can just just disappear. So real quick before we're going to let Tyrell jump in, that kind of reminds me of what Dr. J was saying the other day, and she was basically saying that she didn't want to lose the progress that she had made in emotional intelligence and mental clarity and effective communication. And what I was telling her is, you're not really going to lose what you've gained. That doesn't mean you're going to always get it right. You, you know, people play sports, they miss shots, stuff like that. But that which you have studied and pretty much come to understand, even the fact that you can realize that you didn't effectively communicate yesterday tells you that you have improved because before you wouldn't have even known that you didn't effectively. Right. So that shows growth when you can spot right. your you're spotting your mistakes because you are now in a better position to spot those mistakes and make and take the corrective action. So mm -hmm. I personally tell people, I'm like, I wouldn't worry about not being able to maintain. You know, you're going to know when it's time to cut bait if you're around negative energy. But Tyrell, what's up, man? How you feeling? Welcome back. I ain't talked to you in a while. What's been going on? Nothing much. Traveling. I'm in Iowa right now, so I am a little bit, I've been all over the place. Oh, well, that's good. What's out there? Cornfields? Uh, there's cornfields. There's real estate out here, too. So there's a couple other things. I was just like some good land to invest in. Okay. So what are you, if anything, avoiding or running away from? Oh, okay. So we're, so we're putting people on blast today. Uh, that's what we do now. We, 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 it's just a group therapy session. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be something within yourself. It could be something that you avoid out in society or whatever, but whatever the case may be. Oh, no, I'm transparent enough to put myself on blast um, in, in a liberal context. But I would say one of the things that I am avoiding is spiritual gifts because I'm afraid of how other people will perceive my truthfulness and my authenticity in the space. Okay. Why would you avoid sound so great and prosperous? Because like one of the one of my issues, the reason why I'm avoiding it is because of the fact of I am afraid of having to call people that I have high regards to out when it comes down to things that I know that are wrong but they have been in it for so long there's a level of respect that I have for them but then a higher regard that I have for the position, the place and the call that I would say is on my life. Because I'm, I'm talking more about this in the spiritual realm. I know we talk about it in many different facets. I would say for myself, I'm a very truthful, blunt, and honest person. I don't like to share and quote things. And when something's wrong, I am that person where I'm just like, no, that's wrong. Whether if it's on me or on somebody else. So as someone who is coming up in something, where people that I know operate and utilize and are mature in the same space, but I've witnessed certain things shift in them that is no longer accurate. It, it's not that it intimidates me, but it gives me pause to be like, to eventually have to be like, you want to know what? You're not doing this right anymore. And I'm not saying this because I've now mastered it or I'm now better than you in this space. I'm saying this because 
you lost the essence of why we are where we are. Hmm. Hey, Doc. You um. I saw. I saw you had. A, I saw you had a, a, a reaction when you first started talking. So, what's your uh, perspective on what the brother's saying? I really, I really feel what he's saying because when it comes to what, if you're religious or if you're a Christian, and you know God is pulling on you to go higher or more, it comes with a whole lot of responsibility. A whole lot of responsibility. So that's something that I ran from for a long time because I felt as though I wasn't worthy and I wasn't ready. So I grew up as a Muslim. And when I was about 24, I became a Christian. And once I started going to church, a lot of people say, you should join this ministry, you should leave this ministry. But I felt as though it's too much responsibility, and I don't think I can do that. Um, but it was one song that I still listen to today that made me realize that, yes, I should kind of praise for that says, there's more that I require of thee. So that, I totally felt that when he said that. When, um, what's your name? I'm sorry. Tyrell. My name my name is Tyrell. I'm gonna move to a quieter space. Give me one second. Tyrell, so I really I really felt that when he said that because I, I you know I, I experienced that myself because it comes with a whole lot of responsibility. And then as Christians, a lot of people judge Christianity on the people and how they show up in a religion. You know, and you don't wanna turn people away from God because of your attitude and what you do or if you take a false step because that's what a lot of people do so but isn't 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 um a mutual mic doc real quick isn't christianity based on the idea that we're imperfect and that we're going to make mistakes and that mistakes are in entity it is but when you have people that are not Christians. We know that as Christians. Uh -huh. But when you have people that are not and you're looking to kind of bring people into the fold, they don't look at it that way. And even as Christians in the church, the things that people say is, and you're supposed to be a Christian, like if you take a, a, a step back. So it's like, oh, he acting like that and he's a Christian or she's acting like that. So it is based off of that, but because we are in the world, you know, it's not looked at that way. Oh, okay. Julie, what's your thoughts on that? You have, you have an opinion on that, Julie? Um, I, I understand his point of view, uh, especially with the respect, the respect part. And um, I, I agree. Sometimes, sometimes, the the how could I say this the message that you need to get across or or feel like you should get across to whoever like that person may not be ready to hear whatever you know for whatever reason you know maybe they're in a position of of, of leadership or etc but we all there's always a different point of view right so at times you may be in a leadership position and you, like you said earlier, you can't see yourself, right? Uh -huh. But people around you are watching what's going on. And unfortunately we live in a world where not everybody is ready for the truth to be expressed, you know, in, in such a blunt way. And some would rather you not say anything and just let it be. Okay. So what I got from it, and this is just my perspective, because of what I do, my life can be put in danger based on the decisions of people who have higher rank than I do. Mm -hmm. Right? But my life is my responsibility more than anybody else's. So I live in a world where if what you're doing is putting us in danger, I'm going to say something to you. I'm going to address it to you because 
you have the benefit of not having to go out here and deal with the consequences and repercussions of whatever it is that you're doing out here. I don't have the benefit of sitting in an office and calling shots from the air conditioning. So I, give me one second. Give me one second. And then I'll, I'll definitely let you go. So because of that, that's a little more difficult for me to identify with. Now, I will say it's easier for me to go to a coworker, another officer, and say, yo, you need to check that, than it is to go to, say, a sergeant or lieutenant or a captain. But because of how bad this thing could turn out, I feel like I have a responsibility to say something. So I may find a more palatable way of putting it and not try to make you sound like you don't, like you're incompetent, but I still have to go suffer the consequences of your choices. So I'm going to bring that. I'm going to bring that to you. Tyrell, what were you going to say, my brother? So tagging on to what you said, um, the problem is, and I know I'm going to get smoke for this. So I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say, I'm going to say that now. The problem is when it comes down to a, the, the religious world mm -hmm. and the secular world, Yes, in the religious world, people's lives are still at stake. My life is still at stake. Everyone else who sits alongside me, their lives are at stake, whether if the leadership wants to believe it or not. The problem is that, especially in the African-American culture, especially in the African-American culture, there is, and I'm using this word lightly, there's such a narcissism that is amongst the people and amongst the leadership that even when it comes down to, I wouldn't even say constructive criticism, but even getting wisdom amongst other people that they don't want, they don't want mm -hmm. to be wrong. So because they don't want to be wrong or be told that their idea is not the best idea, that now it is harmful. So there really is no set approach. So I can be right, but because you're in charge, mm -hmm. you, you're not going to hear me because you're in charge of my soul. And I love people and I love, trust, I can, I can recite the book all day. Um, but people are just like, oh, it's better to be obedient than to sacrifice or, or honor your leader or whatever. Yes, those are very true statements. But in those same statements, you have to understand that you have to be amongst people who you can bounce ideas off of so that everyone can grow. Because what good is a leader that can see but can't hear, even if mm -hmm. it's the people that they lead? Because sometimes I can lead you like, I've, I've been in management. I can lead my team to a place that I think is right. But if I don't hear the people that I'm leading and hear how they need to be led to that place, then I, I've done them no justice. All I've done was be a leader to a point to where now I'm pulling people instead of having a team that's pushing. Okay, so okay. that being the case, why would one continue to follow a leader who is leading us off of a cliff? Why wouldn't the follower who sees the cliff coming be like, hey, guys, I know he's not listening, but anyone who's willing to listen to me, we're going off of a cliff here. And I'm about to cut bait. And I think y'all should come with me. And whoever goes off the cliff goes off the cliff, I guess. There's a real fine line between that, though. Because there's a fine line to knowing and be and be like, you want to know what trying to pull and trying to hold everything together, then there is, and then the, the other side of that line is being, um, is almost being trying to take over what something that doesn't belong to you. And you have to be really careful because just like if I just, okay. Let's use this as an example, not saying that this is happening. This is your platform. You come on, you help people um, with these topics all the time. If you started going down off the left off of the left cliff and none of us agreed with you, we can all cut ties from you. 
but as people who came in and and help you talk through some of these topics and help people who are listening, we also have an obligation to keep you from falling. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing when it comes down to to being in any organization. Our job isn't just to be there to and when things get rocky, cut ties and run. Because then that also questions your loyalty. You're supposed to be certain places. You need to be there for the ups and the downs. Yes, there are times when you need a shift. But you have to be there to help re- real people back in, even if it's real and in the leadership. But it sounds, I understand what you're saying. But if the leadership cannot be real then, and I'm jumping in the ocean to save the leadership, I'm not jumping into o- into the ocean to drown with the leadership, right? So... I, I guess I guess what I guess in my mind is it matters how much the leadership is willing to listen to I guess it will be called the fellowship right mm-hmm. right when they say that there are sharks in the water or there's a cliff right there and while I, it may be my job to save you from going off the cliff or getting eaten by the shark it is not my job to go off the cliff with you or get eating by eaten by the shark with you. So I guess it would be for you to figure out at what point is it time for you to save yourself because you can't save everyone. That's kind of how I'm hearing it. But real before before you go, Doc, oh, you got something to add to that? Because I know you you're a leader, right? You you're a principal. So how does what he's saying apply to your perspective on that? So it's it's one of those things where and all leaders aren't good leaders. So it's, are you a leader that promotes collaboration or are you a leader that's promotion, promoting followership or is there, uh, are you a leader that, you know, saying we're in this together? So now if it's a leader that say, I'm in charge, I, wanna, I don't want to hear nothing you say, that's a leader that you don't want to follow. But when you listen as a leader and say we're going to correct collaborate you know and say because i often say this is our school this is our team we have to do this to move forward you can't always look to me i'm a part of the team as well i may just be you know i look at myself i'm part of the team i'm leading the team but you have voices in this too so if you don't promote leadership amongst your team of course Y'all going into a clip. I I look at, it's this book that I read called Our Iceberg is Melting. It's about these penguins or whatever. They put it in. And it's like, you know, one of those things. Somebody sees something, and it makes me think of the movie Happy Feet. I'm going to tell you that. Because it was kind of similar to that, where something was going on. The leadership, they were, you know, I'm not trying to hear it. You, You know, we're not listening to you kind of thing, but you got to listen to the voices of the people because they're usually the ones that are on front line that seeing what's going on. So. Sorry, yeah. There's, I don't know, I just seen this kind of illustration to kind of make it, make it make sense, at least for myself, is if you are climbing on a mountain, they tether each individual together as they climb to help support one as they kind of go up. So, and as they kind of go up, they just kind of like almost jigsaw back and forth to climb the mountain. And while yes, if you're not careful, if the leadership of that missteps or does not sink themselves securely into the mountain, they can fall back and bring everyone with them. At the same time, they ha- the other people who are on that mountain climbing rope have the ability, depending on, and this is a very morbid analogy, if the leader falls and is killed in their fall, the group has the ability to cut the cord. And then sometimes you have to just cut the cord, but cutting the cord doesn't mean that you've taken over because you're not saying that 
this leader just missed a, missed a step, and now we're just going to cut the cord because he doesn't know what he's doing to climb, or she doesn't know what she's doing to climb. But if you've fallen and now you're just dead weight, you're a hazard to the rest of us. So yes, there is a time where you have to cut the cord, but you're not going to cut the cord prematurely. So to go back to what you asked is when they are leading you off of a cliff, are you going to, like, when do you cut when do you cut the cord and pretty much establish a new leader? Sometimes you just have to wait until they almost do it to themselves. And then at that point, you can cut the cord and get rid of the dead weight. But you have to be very careful because if you do it too soon, you can cut something that was still viable and still could have helped you. Because right. you're not going to cut the cord on somebody who could still climb you gonna cut the corner to someone who can't climb anymore. Yeah, I, I I feel you. And so like like you were saying too though, I think it's important for you to be able to be and when I say you, I don't just mean you, I mean you in general, right? I think it's important for you to be able to approach leadership in a respectful and articulate way mm -hmm. to let them know like, hey, we're getting close to a bad point, a dangerous point. And if leadership isn't receptive to that, then you know, like, okay, we went from code yellow to code red at this point because leadership is no longer listening. And at some point, if this continues on, we're going to have to cut the cord on you. But the fact that you're willing to have the conversation, Coach Jay, have the conversation, um, to me, will make whoever has to cut the cord be more comfortable with making that choice because we're not cutting the cord without telling you that this is that this could potentially be coming. We've given you the heads up that you know we're going in the wrong direction. We've done our part. Now as our leader, it's your job to hear us out, analyze the information we've given you and make a decision. But at the end of the day, we've told you we're getting close to the cliff and we're not going off the cliff with you. Yeah, and sometimes it's just because you see that the cord needs to be cut, sometimes you're not the one that needs to cut it. Sometimes you can be the warning factor, but sometimes you just don't need... Sometimes it's not your position to cut the cord. So while that, with all that being said, yes, we can all see that the cord needs to be cut, but it may not be my job to cut the cord. It may be my job to solo climb for a little while and find another team. And then when that time comes, I just warned y'all. I told y'all y'all need to cut this cord because there's a space and a time where my growth and separation has grown to the point to where I didn't I I need to be attached to y'all for a little bit. Now that I've detached, I still know that it's it's a bad t for you guys to be tethered together. But because you guys are still tethered together, that's on y'all. I'm not here, so it's it's inappropriate for me to cut the cord and I'm leaving anyway. Yeah, okay, yeah, and I understand that. My whole thing is take your power back, take your power back. So e even if you're not going to cut the cord from the leader to the group, you still inform the group, hey, look, this was going on, I talked to the leader, but I'm going to cut my cord and attach myself to this other group, right? Because you would have to cut your cord from that group. Like, you don't have to cut their cord, but you're still attached. There's a cord from you to the group. You would cut your cord, right? Yeah, but there's still an avoidance that's there because the avoidance is how do you tell people that one, may not want to see it, two, that may see it and may not want to believe it, or three, that may see it, may not want to believe it, but then they're so emotionally attached to it that now they're avoiding the fact that this is now a hostile situation. Like you said, it's gone from a cold yellow to a cold red. So they're now... So now I've witnessed, or I know that it has gone from a cold yellow to a cold red. I've told everyone that it's gone from a cold yellow to a cold red. But because of my position of where I'm separating, I can only say but so much. That's just like on, like, let's use this as an example. The FBI knows that a cellmate got wind that a cellmate is going gonna, is gonna to break out of prison, and this is a cellmate who, who's a mass murderer. Julie, they, right. they know, FBI knows that this is a hostile situation. They know that there's some sort of degree of separation that needs to, that needs to happen. But 
they're not going to go away and, and be like, you want to know it? In some, in some case, in some cases, and they're not going to go in and try to hijack the prison's system of leadership to now come in and say, okay, well, we're going to take over because you guys aren't managing the fact that you guys know that this prison is about to break out and release havoc on this whole entire community. Yeah, but I would expect the FBI to do that if if that were if if we were getting close to the point of this guy getting out and killing a bunch of civilians, right? This is why I said there there is a level of ex when when they're going to get involved. Like we yeah, can only, okay. only going to get involved in certain in certain spaces in certain times, or when it gets to an extreme. But until it gets to that point, and the FBI feels like they are now liable or now need to get involved, they're going to watch that prison almost go up in flames before they go ahead and start dabbling in it and try to rectify the situation. It's going to be right before it catches flames when the FBI is going to be like, okay, now we're going to go in and help out. Well, yeah, but see, but even, even if you were to use the FBI, the FBI and the intelligence agencies have had information on, say, like people who ended up doing mass shootings and they waited too long. Right. And that's one of the things about if you're just talking law enforcement as an example, you're always trying to figure out what is the point when I act, because you don't necessarily want to be preemptive. Right. Because you don't violate people's rights or use the wrong amount of force and things like that. But sometimes being preemptive is what saves lives. Right. So if, if that's what it is, then that's just what it is. And I mean, being in law enforcement and I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a street cop. I'm a patrol guy. But I, I get the logic of. You know, somebody might have to do something that the public doesn't necessarily like in order for a better outcome than the worst possible outcome to be the actual outcome. And if that's what it is, you stand up there, you take your lunch, you tell them why you did what you did, based you articulate yourself, and that's where your ability to to uh, to be grounded in your beliefs and your authenticity and your genuineness come into play. And if you judge me for that, then you're just going to have to judge me for that. And I'll take that. I'll take those lumps, however, however they come. Dr. Hawk, you got something? Yeah. You know, this kind of comes back to the original question of running from things and avoiding things, because as a leader, you can't run from situations that you know you're going to have to face, because if you run from it, eventually it can be disastrous. So um, that's something where that you're running from, you know, that thing that you know you have to face because you've been warned people that are um, following you have shared that with you. But if you stand still and don't do anything, you know, is you know, you're not going to know what to do when things, you know, happen. Just like in schools, we have to do these drills, fire drills, active shooter drills. Now, we know, we see what's going on. And if I was a principal that didn't do these drills and something was to happen, you know, I put my people in a situation where they can end up, you know, you know, lives can be cost because we avoided or we ran from this thing that we know we have to do. Because we often say, oh, it's not going to impact us. It's not going, this is not going to happen with us. But it goes back to running from things and avoiding things. And as leaders, you talked about leadership, we can't run from stuff. Now, we can avoid some things because it's not, you know, good for the organization, but we definitely can't run from stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree. And, you know, on a day-in, day-out basis, I don't always have the option of avoiding or running. So for me, I think a lot of the times it's more cut and dry. Like I was telling y'all yesterday, like, dude ended up spitting right on my face. Like, he had that dude assaulted somebody. He had to go to jail. So as much as I would rather not be getting on this bus and potentially having to pepper spray you or tase you or fight you or, or worse, I still have to go in some capacity and address this. I'm, they're, they're like, I'm the one they call. There is nobody for me to call. So I have to go address this. And so that's why I just think in terms of communication, like, people – People will hit me up and be like, yo, how do you do this day in, day out and talk to people? I'm like, well, because what I have to do at work is way more contentious. So to sit here and have a conversation about topics, this is nothing. It's easy. I can just tell you what I think. If you don't like it, kick rocks. If you do like it, use it to your advantage. 
but it's not necessarily going to I'm not so affected by anyone's opinion of my opinion or who I am as a person because I know that I'm being genuine in my perspectives. So if I go to a Dr. Hulk, right, at her school, or if I go to Julie Bain at her dance studio and say, hey, you know, I've been here for a while, I've been a part of it, and I kind of think things are going the wrong way in some capacity, and you, if Dr. Hulk or Julie feel some type of way, that's for them to deal with. I'm just saying, I'm just being honest. I'm being loyal to you by telling you what it is that I see here. You know? And that, that was going to be my question for you. Like, with you being on this platform, are there things that you try to overweight or you try to run from being in, on this platform? In terms of the platform? Yeah. No, in terms of the platform, I'll pretty much discuss anything. Now, I don't really have a desire to get into the LGBTQ thing, right? But if someone wanted to have the conversation, I don't have a problem having the conversation. If somebody wanted to discuss uh, the vaccine, we could discuss the vaccine. If you want to discuss how to raise your kids, I'll talk about pretty much any of it. Because for the most part, I've done a lot of research on a lot of different things. So typically, if I'm making a point about something, it's because I've read about it. Now, I don't know, every, obviously, I don't know everything about everything, so I'll give disclaimers and be like, I don't know that much about this, but this is my perspective. And I'm not really one to particularly hide my perspective. I'll omit it if no, one's, if no one asks, but if someone asks me a question about abortion, I'm going to tell you my opinion on abortion. And if you don't like my opinion on abortion, you can deal with that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't like yours either. So what does it matter, right? So that's kind of how I uh, how I see it. Julie, Ben, you've been kind of quiet. What you washing dishes or something over there? I was cutting onions, and I didn't want to start crying. <laughs> but but what I was gonna say was the reason why I picked this topic is because I have come across a lot of people who just plain out just avoid whatever it is, and I feel like I don't know if they know this, but at the end of the day, you're going to have to deal with it, whether it's now or in a year or in 10 years, whenever. Um, you're going to have to deal with it. So why not kind of create yourself a toolkit, which is exactly what you know we're doing by getting the information that we need and learning from other people that have you know gone through whatever the experience is that you're trying to avoid. So that way you know how to better handle it and know how to face the situation versus just avoiding it altogether because that doesn't doesn't change anything. That's like a temporary fix, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't really, at the end of the day, change anything. Mm. I like that. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I, going back, I know somebody said, does running and avoiding to the intersection. And here's a perfect example of where avoiding and running hit the intersection. And it is with bullying. It's with bullying. Because if there's someone that's bullying you, you do try to avoid them. You do try to avoid situations where you're putting yourself in a situation where you're being bullied. But if that bully in their mind is like, every time I see you, I'm going to do something, then it may be a thing where you start running. But again, if you have to run every time from that, it has to come to a point where you're going to have to face that bully. You might even get your behind beat by that bully, but, you know, when you face it, things do change as far as, you know, maybe they'll move on to the next target now if I stand up to that bully. So. I, I, I agree. I like the, uh, I like the bully analogy back in middle school i had a bully for about three days right he tried to take my lunch money a couple of times i never gave it to him and i i'm a i'm a peaceful person right i'm i'm introverted i'm laid back i'm chill and i'm like look because like you know i'm not really trying to do this i get straight a's i do my homework <laughs> you know what i'm saying <laughs> leave me alone and i know one day in gym class we were sitting next to each other and the teacher was sitting on the gym floor and he plucked me on my ear i'm like hey look because like don't touch me the teacher sitting right there. He did it again. I punched him in the mouth. And that was pretty much the end of that. So 
you can avoid, you can run, you can hide. But at some point, these things that you're avoiding, running and hiding from, they're going to meet you face to face and they're going to put you in a corner. The way I see it is, is the sooner I know that I'm avoiding something, I might as well start devising a plan to come face to face with this thing. And um, Jordan Peterson talks about this. He talks about the stories of, you know how people talk about slaying the dragon? And he talks mm -hmm. about, he it's kind of cool. I love hearing how he breaks it down because he says, it's better for you to go meet the dragon in the cave and slay the dragon in the cave before the dragon comes out of the cave and starts burning down the whole society. So the sooner you face the dragon, the easier it is to, to defeat the dragon, make the dragon your friend or whatever the case may be. I think the difficult part of it is sometimes is internally, we don't, to, to, to respond to what Julie's saying, we don't, we don't always consciously know what other people can see or, or know about us. So when Julie says, okay, Charles, I think you're selfish, I don't see myself as selfish. So I don't feel the need to face my selfishness until the situation becomes so dire and I'm forced to look at it as opposed to me questioning it beforehand. Dr. J, you back in action. Yeah, I'm back in action. I was getting ready for my event, but I didn't want to be rude and not come on. <laughs> all right, it's all good. So we won't hold you long, just real quick. In your in, in your personal life and society or within your inner self, is there something that you feel like you are avoiding or running away from? Uh, I might be avoiding difficult conversations right now. <laughs> oh, I got a real good book for that called, you know the name of the book? That's the book, Dr. J. What? Don't Avoid Difficult Conversations? The name of the book is Difficult Conversations. Right. And, okay. and the whole premise of the book, hold on one second. The whole premise of the book is it teaches you how to have difficult conversations. And one of the main tenets in the book is the facts are not as are not as relevant to people as the way they feel about the facts. Right. So you and I can have. um Okay, Dr. Hall, appreciate you. Um, you and I can um, experience or witness the same event. You follow me? Yes. And we may have a disagreement about how that situation unfolded or how it should have unfolded, right? But what's more important than the actual event that occurred, that occurred. how it makes you feel, how it makes I feel, Right. Because we both saw the event. So from a factual standpoint, we know what happened, right? So when you approach me and I approach you about having this conversation, I'm going to approach it less about trying to prove your perspective wrong and more about trying to understand the perspective you have and why you have the perspective you have. So now it becomes more of an informative conversation as opposed to a who's right or who's wrong conversation. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. So if you're avoiding the difficult conversation, all you can really do is improve your ability to, to communicate while having a difficult conversation. Meaning if I did something to hurt Dr. J's feelings, right, and I'm kind of avoiding it and Dr. J wants to talk to me about it, the best thing I can do is when I talk to Dr. J, instead of trying to prove Dr. J wrong, I'll say, well, why do you feel the way you feel, right? Why does that make you feel that way? You say, well, it makes me angry because you did X, Y, and Z. Well, why did that make you angry? It wasn't, you know, do you feel like I was being disrespectful to you, mm -hmm. right? Do you think my actions were intentional? So I'm gathering information so that I can better understand your perspective. Now, I may not come to a point where I actually agree with you, okay? Right? but I may be able to understand why you have the perspective that you have. And because I can understand why you have the perspective that you have, we're on more common ground now. So now when I tell you I view things the way I view them, you're going to feel more inclined to understand my perspective as opposed to prove me wrong because I've heard you out. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yes. I understand what you're saying. 
Uh-huh. But so you're saying, no, not a butt shows, not a butt. Look, you, I, this is my first day back, Julie. Get ready, give me, put me in the box. It like you're about to I'm sorry. But okay, not a butt. However, because <laughs> I almost said butt. However, is not understanding the perspective still a form of avoidance? Are you, are you doing it intentionally? Mm, depends on who I'm having a conversation with. <laughs> mm. I'm not trying to see the person's perspective, then you're not being genuine to the conversation anyway. So why are we even bothering to have this conversation? Okay, you got me. That's you, see true. you see what I'm saying? I, so yes. there, has to be, there has to be some authentic, authenticity that occurs between the two parties. Okay. As opposed to me trying to win something or prove you wrong, I just want to understand why you see things the way you see things. Why does it make sense to you that way? Because it doesn't make sense to me that way. So you know, people make it make sense, right? It makes sense. Okay. Another tactic too is, especially like if you're talking um like um, family relationships, marriages, and stuff like that. Another thing to do too is if two people or a group of people two separate groups or or two people are having a disagreement is to, before you go have that conversation is to find out how you contributed to the negative outcome. Right. Mm -hmm. I know. So we, we, we have a disagreement about this and I know I did some things or didn't do some things that contributed to the outcome. Right. And you Mm -hmm. didn't do some things that contributed to the outcome. So, when I approach this conversation, a good tactic is to come to that person and it, and accept my responsibility for the negative outcome. What did I contribute? Hey, listen, I know we disagree. We had an argument about this, 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 and that. And I know from my perspective, these are the things that I could have done better and improved upon or done differently, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the things that I think you could have done. What is your perspective of that? Because now I've admitted my fault. I've told you what I think is your fault. And you have the opportunity to do the same thing, which is admit your fault and tell me what you think, how I contributed to it. Okay. So that's that's just my opinion in terms of the, the whole the whole difficult conversations. Julie, I'm sure you've had some difficult conversations in the yeah. past a little bit. What 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 do you think about what uh, Dr. J is saying and, and what I and what I said in response? Um, my only problem with that is what if the person, again, here I go again about (laughs) everybody's past, what if they're just not ready to accept, like, like, we always got to bend over backwards for people. And that's the part that's so difficult for me. Like, I got to accept responsibility for what I did and acknowledge how the other person feels, etc. But it's not a level playing field because that other person isn't even remotely taking responsibility for their part in it either. So it's like, you think you're going to have a very productive conversation and all they want to do is play the victim. Like, that just drives me crazy. Yeah, well, at that point, though, the question becomes, because if you know that you have been genuine in your approach, you've honestly admitted how you contributed to the outcome, you have articulated to them how they contributed to the outcome, and they don't want to be malleable or flexible enough to meet you on common ground, then the question becomes, why am I still subjecting myself to your presence? Exactly. Right? Like, why it's obvious you you don't really want to negotiate some type of amicable outcome. So I'm going to take my power all the way back. You can kick boulders and I'm going to go ahead about my business. Not boulders. Right. But, <laughs> but, but it's very important too, because people get attached to outcomes. Right. And just because you don't get the outcome you didn't want doesn't mean, just because you didn't get the outcome that you actually wanted doesn't mean that the practice and the techniques and everything that you put in are useless or worthless. They're just not applicable with this person because they're not self-aware enough to receive it. 
another person that you come across in life, you're going to vibe with that person because they're going to be more on the same level. Mm -hmm. Right. And I always use sports. Dudes in the NBA, they go to they go to practice every day. They've been playing ball their whole lives. And just because they don't win the chip in their career doesn't mean they didn't put in the work. It doesn't mean they didn't improve their game or didn't improve their jump or, or become a better defender. They just didn't get the outcome that they had. The outcome been self-improvement, you would get it. And I can prove that to you by saying previously, before doing the work, if you had the conversation, it would have been more difficult for you to let the conversation yeah. go, right? Absolutely. But you know that you've done the work and you did everything you could. When it's time to cut bait, it's time to cut bait and you're okay with that because you know, like, I've done everything that I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that I absolutely agree with because I have had the same conversation, you know, for an entire year. And every time... I see an improvement in myself. Right. And and too, especially when you're when you're talking about dealing with difficult conversations and emotions, you can watch yourself have these conversations. You can feel your emotions moving and mm -hmm. shifting, right? And before you may have like completely acted out of those emotions. Yeah. And 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 curse somebody or raise your tone or just acted differently than you do now. The the basic fact that you can now even complete a thought from A to B to C to D and connect them and tell this person when before you would just fly off the handle shows you that you've made progress. But if you're so focused on the outcome, which they have 50% 50 control over, right? You don't even have complete control over the outcome. So, But you do have complete control over your reactions to them. Your, how you approach it, to, how you approach them, your reaction to them, and your reaction to the outcome. If you gauge that, you take your power back. If you gauge it on the outcome, that's like being mad at yourself because you picked the picnic date three months out, and on that day it rained. It rained. Yeah, All right, exactly. we're playing the picnic, right? Make sure the sandwiches are good. You know, the ants not going to get in it. We're going to have some good fresh lemonade, and maybe we have to end up having a picnic in the house. And right, everything right. looks good, but I can't control the rain. God yeah. or the government does that. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Maybe it's a little bit of both, right? But I like to get people to reassess what the goal is. Because if the goal is always outside of yourself, then there's always going to be an aspect of it that you don't control. If the goal is within yourself, then you can truly know the level of effort that you put forth and be okay with whatever that outcome is. And if it's not an outcome you want, it's easier for you to end that relationship or not talk to that person anymore and just move on and be good and, and, and be blessed and all of that good stuff. So, Dr. J., what do yeah. you think about that? Which, which I had to text you today. Make sure you was okay. You was MIA for a couple of days. So I had to make sure you were good. Listen, Instagram was playing with me, okay? The devil is a liar because they was playing with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> was not trying to let me on, Julie. <laughs> that that happened to me earlier this week, too. See? They got the hit that happened to me, too. What about my password or something? Mm. See what so, I'm saying? Um, yeah, I agree with what you're saying. I agree with everything you're saying. I think it's a good perspective. I mean, I'm going to try to apply it to a conversation that I'm going to have. Wait, I looked up and you smoke. <laughs> I looked up and you smoking and Julie eating. So I'm avoiding black and miles because I had a little trip where I was stuck on these black and miles. And I said, well, last time I quit completely, I used the vape. So I went and got the vape. So I'm going to step down. I know you're the doctor, so I know you don't like it, but I'm working my way through it. In terms of what am I avoiding? Yeah, what are you avoiding? I would love to know. Uh-oh, hold on. Oh. Hold on one second. I'm trying to make sure that, the, that I don't lose the screen recording because I'm pretty sure I just lost it, but that's okay. I'll have the hard file. Maybe this one doesn't have the um, the comments. Um. 
I don't know specifically what I'm avoiding, but here recently I came to the realization that I have a tendency to laugh at um my traumas or when I can't change the outcome of something or it doesn't go my way, I have a tendency to laugh at it. So it's almost like I'm laughing to avoid <laughs> to avoid the pain. The emotion. The, the emo emotion. Well, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, the real emotion, right? The real you know emotion. laugh. Yep. I laugh. I laugh. Yeah. I don't. Mm -mm. And so um I laugh. And so um <laughs> That's one thing that I, I'm trying to be more conscious of, which is, am I laughing to avoid my pain about this particular thing? Or is it really funny? Now, are you doing that by yourself? Sometimes it just depends. It just depends on the situation. Okay, because I've done that before, and people get offended because they think that you like laughing at them. When you're really laughing to avoid the anger or the pain or whatever, and people really think, are you laughing at this situation? Like, this is a real situation. Right. Hold on. Let's see something. Somebody just called somebody a bozo, so we're going to bring them in and give them an opportunity to say it to our faces. <laughs> Let's see. Waiting. We're waiting for you. You're in the comments. Come on up. We can't hear you, Dr. J. Who said that? Royal 3X3 said you're expressing yourself, Bozo. Oh, okay, Bozo. <laughs> okay. Now we all laughing. <laughs> okay. Just give me one second. Okay, I need, I need to drop off real quick. Doctor J, staying on. I, and for a little while, Doctor J, about to you see what I'm doing. Where are you going? Where are you? you see what I'm doing, I Juice? See, My, I see friend. you. <laughs> see that? Wow! Point? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to an event. I have an event to go to today. Oh, cause you look real nice. Thank you. You know I try, I try. <laughs> Y'all done? Okay. I'm <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. She cute tell though, so I had to say something. Oh, it's all good. It's all good. I respect that. You about to slide off, Julie? I'll be right back, yeah. All right, so so before you go, tell me your qu what your question was again so I can answer it and then we can keep it moving. So the question was, do you laugh um, because you're avoiding the emotion? And how do you think that makes the other person feel if you, like, in a serious situation and you just bust out laughing uh okay all right well i'll let you slide off and i'll try my best to answer that and then if you want to come back you can okay so how do you avoid laughing at yourself when the other person could perceive that you're laughing at them yes i think that's kind of a tough one especially if you're involved in an argument and you end up laughing at yourself for having a crazy thought or saying something that you feel is kind of silly or ignorant or stupid. And I mean, I guess the best you could do is just be honest with him and tell him like, no, I, I could see why you would think I was laughing at you, even though this is a very serious matter. I just had this crazy thought or this crazy perspective and I was laughing at that. But, you know, I think that really just comes down to our desire to have people completely know and understand us. And when you accept that people aren't always going to understand you, it's just okay. You can apologize. Hey, listen, I can see why me laughing came off like I was laughing at you or the situation, but that's not what that was. But the more you, so I think the more you have a desire for other people to see you in the light that you want them to see you in, the more power they have over you. And the less you care about how they see you or how they perceive you, the less power they have over you. I mean, I laugh when, like, I have a tendency, you know, to bust out laughing. Like, mm -hmm. if say something to me serious, sometimes, like, I just laugh. And does that get you into trouble? Huh? Does that get you into trouble? Yeah. Like, they get, people get offended by it. Like, what you laughing at? That's not funny. 
Okay, so what? So so how do you think um, the laughing, your laughing, or our laughing makes them feel? I don't know. I think it's a, I don't know. It's a defense mechanism. Uh huh. If like if we talk it seriously and I just bust out laughing, I think it's a defense mechanism. Mm -mm. So you, so you just like I was saying, you're laughing to avoid the negative, the negative emotion. Yeah, but. So research on that i'm gonna find a book on laughing to avoid pain and find out what it is that i can find out about it and then it's i'll come a book called laughing to avoid pain say again it's a book called <laughs> laughing to avoid pain no i don't know i'm saying i'm gonna i'm gonna see if i can find any books on people on you know laughing to avoid pain okay as a, as a reaction to trauma you see what I'm saying? Or as a reaction to negative emotions. Okay. What does that mean? And I don't know. I've always done it. Okay. So, Dr. Hawk said, I laughed when I was reciting my vows. My husband was big man. He probably thought, he probably was like, oh, that's right. Never mind. Let me leave Dr. Hawk alone. Dr. Hawk says she's never been caught lying. So, but maybe you were just nervous. Because people laugh when they're nervous, too, right? Yeah, that's what she said. I was nervous. So, yeah, that's all good. That's all it was. But other than um, Dr. Don Colbert has a book on that. Patty Mayonnaise, uh, put the name. Can you uh, somebody look that up for me, if you could? Dr. Don Colbert has a book on that. Yeah, I, I want to read that one because I'm, I'm interested in that. That could be some um, some growth that we can all have, and we could discuss that on the Mars Mindset. So I ain't going to hold y'all too much longer. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get out of here a little bit early today. And we're going to have to do it for two hours. Don't leave yet, Jay. We're going to sign off together. So I say, I know you're still doing your uh, your hair and stuff. So is there anything you would like to say in closing, Dr. Jay, before we slide off? Don't avoid difficult conversations. They can be a pathway to happiness. <laughs> okay. Good one. Um, <laughs> Dr. Hawk said, I couldn't believe that I was about to really be somebody's wife. Yeah, that's when I think life got surreal. You know what I'm saying? You slipped into a parallel universe. You hadn't been nobody's wife ever. And then that moment came and it's like, oh, wow, this is happening. Um, so Dr. J says, don't avoid difficult conversations. I would add to that, if you have the ability to prepare yourself for the difficult conversation before it occurs, then that way you can be more concise and understanding and open-minded about having those particular conversations and validation is a big part of it so be able to understand the other person's perspective um yeah in general in terms of avoidance and running away if the outside world has something that's negative and you can't avoid it or run away from it maybe it's good to but I think it's smart to know when it's better to meet something early than too late. Because the longer you wait to confront something, the stronger it gets. So if you can attack it in its infant, infant stages, it'll probably be easier to contend with. So that's just something to think about. And the world is a mirror. So if the people you love and the people closest to you are pointing out to you certain aspects of your personality that you can't see or that you disagree with, at least take some time to investigate those things. They may see something in you that you can't see in yourself. And that could be a pathway to self-improvement. So with that being said, uh, Julie Bean, Dr. Hulk, Tyrell, and Dr. J, I appreciate y'all for contributing to the show today. Did I miss anybody else? I don't think I missed anybody else, did I? No. If I did, I apologize. Blame it on my mind, not my heart. Y'all be good. Be blessed. Be safe. Hopefully the screen recording works. And uh, if you're ever feeling down, think of me because I can be your life coach. Take your power back. Peace.